<laughs> right, we are talking about systems thinking, code, teams, legacy systems, quite a mix of things. So my name is Lorraine Stain. I come from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, I do things like hiking. It's a very windy city. That is actually my Berlin t-shirt from a previous visit, <laughs> being hiked on the Cape Town mountains. Yeah, we're going to talk about teams and code and systems thinking. I'm quite interested to know how many of you are developers, software developers still, yeah? And how many are more in the sort of agile, scrum mastery role couple? And then I presume an awful lot of you also call yourselves architects, is that right? So some, yeah? A lot. OK, thank you, so I know. It was quite a lot of hands for developers, and I want to mention something about how much fun it was when we first got into development. And if you remember the joy of that first program that ever compiled, <laughs> you know, it, just, it was just so much fun. And I think, I mean, I truly believe that developers want to do a good job. All right. Though we, given the right environment, we want to do a, big, a good job. In which case, what's going on, right? Why is it that the all code appears to become a big ball of mud over time? Any reasonably large code base worked on by more than one person <laughs> for some duration of time seems to slide into this big ball of mud. I have a slide I use sometimes which shows an avalanche and starts off, you know, you've got all this pristine white snow, and that's what we want our stuff to look like. It's all organized, it's, you know, and then it just turns into this mud at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> All right. So we're going to apply systems thinking to this, to this question of basically what is happening and why, given our joy of actually developing, are we always not always able to do the job we want to do? I mean, the first question we have to ask is like, you know, are we stupid? <laughs> All right, so that was not the answer. And people like... Um, W. Edwards Deeming, they said that it's actually our management, which would be a, quite a convenient thing to blame. But there's a lot of truth in this, that management gets in the way of what we're doing often. Right? We, we, we have scrum teams. Um, I really loved an earlier talk that was talking about developers and the teams as being in a ter terrarium. Did I say that right? Um, almost as though we're protected from everyone else. Why do we need to be protected? We need to be protected from bad management. I read a thing which called um, Agile a trauma response to the bad management that preceded it. <laughs> right. So Deeming says that 80% of the problem is more management. He also says that the role of management is to change the system, not the people. And I also love that. Because too many managers are like, well, let's just sort of flog the people. One of the other big problems we have is environment, although with most of us working from home now, we're more in charge of that. Um, I'm going to reference another very old study. Years and years and years ago, the people were people. That these code wars analyses. And I don't think it matters that it's old. I think if we, well, what they did is they took oh, just under 200 programmers in about 35 organizations. They all did the same sort of projects, and then they evaluated. And that conditions like you weren't allowed to debug it. It had to be your first, your first effort was handed in and see how good that was and things like that. And the top 25% of the performers had certain things in common. They had low interruption rates. You know, they, they had a little more space on, in general and quieter environments and more control over phones and interruptions. And, and those things are as true today as they were then. Right? And how many of us come in early or get up early because it's the only time we can get something done? You know, because once the, the working day starts, our time is just shredded. Okay, so we still got these problems. I love going on little rants. So I was going to go on a rant about the modern office. Because for some reason, office designers decided we like to open plan. Um, we like big windows. That drives me insane. If I didn't see blinds, I know I've got glare on my screen. 
I'm not impressed at all. I'm so relieved that for, I mean, how many of you get to do remote work? Yes, me too. I love it. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> but at home, it's cozy. It's got our, it's personalized. It maybe has a cat. It's usually quite close to our kitchen. <laughs> really good things. And that's what we prefer when we work for ourselves. You know, when we work in our own environment, I don't see our businesses setting up those environments we love. So working environment is important. I mean, these sound like all extraneous factors. What's it got to do with the teams? But it's really important that you can work. Now let's move on to something a bit more technical and very relevant to this conference. Because we've been talking about should you be doing architecture up front and should it evolve? Now, when I pitched this talk, I was talking more about systems that already exist. And it's wonderful if you're doing greenfields. A lot of people are. Good for you. A lot more of us are keeping old things running. There's a lot of that work still available, and even what you're doing now becomes an old thing that has to be kept running, right? And some of those early decisions just sit there in our way. I've been to a lot of uh, legacy talks where they teach you how to refactor. But you can't just do incremental change when you've got fundamentally wrong things in your architecture. Yeah. So I refer to those things as blockers. No matter how good a job you want to do, if you have blockers, you're, you can't do a good job around them. I'm not going to tell you how to fix them, but I'm just telling you that that's a thing that we need to look at. And I'll pull this all into one coherent picture in a moment, just for the fun of it. That bridge, it's a highway we built in Cape Town. And we built it about 45 years ago, and I don't know if we just lost our will to finish it, <laughs> but it just stands there, and it's such a symbol of, like, you know, how code goes sometimes. You know, the, the, the um, tooling, the, the, the structures you build and the uh, frameworks, and then you don't actually end up using it as you thought, and, yeah. Processes, yeah. Remember, it was individuals over processes. And we know it, but we don't do it. Now, this is a blurred out Jira screen from hell. It's an, actually one of my team's boards. And I mean, it starts so nicely. Uh, some scrum master, the team, whoever, you know, has decided we're doing, going to bring in Jira, the tickets that will help us control everything. And we design our columns, and we decide we'll probably categorize tickets, we can get some stats, and we've got good intentions. And then we start using it. And this board, the um, first, first problem that hit was duplicates. We hadn't designed it for every user sends in the same ticket when there's a bug on the system. And <laughs> now you can't just close them, so you've got to spend a lot of time linking them all up together because you've got 17 reports of the same issue. But it's okay, we, we had a meeting with the different departments. We agreed that maybe they could have a super user and they would channel everything. So we built a bit more process for our process. And then we found our categories weren't working so well. Um, and we were only using about two of them, everything was ending up there. And, and we, had, we had some more meetings. You know, to, anyway, eventually you find you are serving the process. The process is not serving you. You know the story of the frog, and if you turn up the water, he doesn't jump out because he just gets used to it. I and mean, so often when I look at process, I feel like the frog in the pot. Because you just kind of go, well, that's what we're supposed to do, right? Yeah. I mean, somebody else designed this process, and I've just got to do it. The truth is, by the way, the frog does jump out. Frogs aren't that stupid. <laughs> that makes me wonder about me because we just put up with a lot of bad process, a hell of a lot of bad process, which also allows me to do a little rant about Agile, because we did say individuals over processes. I mean, we do know this, we just don't live it. And I, I think, I just hear it so often from companies, um, we can bring in a process to fix that. 
It's almost, you know, like they're trying to fix the people by, by putting us into more and more straitjackets. That's that, that little rant. And then we didn't say no plan. <laughs> We just said we're supposed to be able to respond to plan, respond to change over following the plan. And somewhere along the line, that got turned into no planning or no architecture, right? So I've got a lovely quote for you from Eisenhower, I think it was. He said, um, plans are useless, but planning is invaluable. Same with architecture, eh? Those big upfront Discussions you might have about where you want to go, creating shared visions. I'm all for those. Just don't cast it in concrete. Yeah. And my last one of the things that get in our way, and this is where I'll spend most of the time of this talk, is that horrible word resources. Um, when you start treating people like interchangeable Lego blocks, you really don't understand the problem. <laughs> yeah, so we are not interchangeable Lego blocks. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time explaining why I believe that's much more important than we realize. So this is where the systems thinking really starts to tie it all together. Systems thinking says that, that these are systems, right? These, these ways our working environments are put together are systems. And whatever result they're giving is what they were designed to do. Not what, what they were meant to do necessarily, <laughs> but it is what they do. Okay, so I think that's quite encouraging because then if it means the system's wrong and it means we're not stupid, and actually if we could figure out what's wrong with the system, we could figure out what we wish to change so that we get to do the job we were supposed to do in the first place. Because seriously, I want that joy back, the joy of creating and developing as part of my working life. So systems thinking first and foremost says we need to think about the whole picture, which is why I've kind of given you these five things where I've went around all the things that go wrong in our days. Now, for all the developers here, you and me, we, we are detail people. <laughs> so actually, we're not that good at the big picture. We actually have to force ourselves to try and be a bit more holistic. I did this talk uh, previously, and I, someone came up afterwards, and they were like, um, what kind of thing is systems thinking? And the fact is, it's the natural thinking. It's what, what we used to know when we were kids, before we got taught how to do analytical thinking, where we break things apart, where we deconstruct to try and understand stuff. This is putting it all back together. This is looking at the whole, okay? How many people? already know quite a bit about systems thinking. A couple of hands, but then I'll go a little slower. Because I want to give you some fundamentals, and hopefully you can apply them. I'm going to start at the sort of smallest end. When we look at all the elements that make up a system, there are actually, when certain things happen, they trigger other things. There are these feedback loops. Sometimes we're not aware of them but they're there. Now, most systems want to be stable, okay? You know, I'm too hot, I take off my jersey, I'm back to the right temperature. Our systems, most things, we want stability. So we talk about balancing loops. And, um, yeah, it's not necessarily that it's good stable, right? <laughs> it's just stable. It's a, at some point where the system has reached, okay, that's where I live. And so many of our systems are there. The, the really interesting loop is the reinforcing one. So I use the picture of the, the stampede, because if you know uh, um, herd animals, if one starts to run, the other runs, until they're all running. And you can't stop them, right? You do not want to get in the way of this, because it, it like reinforces. But just like the stampede, reinforcing loops tend to run out of steam. Uh, I mean, COVID ran out of steam, luckily, without killing us all. You know, like, but um, this positive reinforcing, obviously, is the good kind. So you put money in the bank, you earn some interest on it, you have more money, you earn more interest. That's a positive reinforcing loop. The negative reinforcing loops, they're the scary ones. 
if you get a team that's like a bit unhappy, that one person is unhappy, makes the other one unhappy, and assume the whole team's unhappy, it's much faster, the negative stuff often, than trying to turn it around. All right, so we'll play a little game. I, I sometimes do this as a workshop, and then we hand out these little cards with scenarios on them, and you get the card, and now you've got to like, think. Is that a balancing loop? What's the loop? What's going on? So here's the first one for you to think about. A team has a deadline. Management asks for limited overtime. So in systems thinking, we have some excess of work, so we ask for more hours to bring it into balance. Okay. That's how you would solve that, uh, the, that problem in the system. Too much work, ask for more hours, bring it into balance. But sometimes we get the sum wrong. There was much more work. We couldn't bring it into balance of those hours, so over time drags on. What sort of loop happens now? Well, the team gets tired, so they're less productive. So they put in more hours, and they get less productive. And it's a nasty, reinforcing negative loop, where you get a lot less done. So if you want to ever, you know, you want my scenarios, I've got a couple of sets of the cards you could ask for afterwards. Okay, so those are the loops. It's really, if you're trying to analyze what's going wrong or right in your teams and your systems, you must be able to find the feedback loops. Just figure out where they are and how you, how you get to see what they're doing. The bigger picture is you've got to think, the system is de delivering something of value. It has some purpose. So we often talk about the stock of it. I don't really like the word stock because it sounds very physical. And a system can be our happiness, our, our productivity, our teamness. Okay. Um, and there are things that come into that. They come in fast, they can come in slow. There's ways you can take off from that stock. You can use it. To, you know, I used coffee as an example because, hey, developers. Software teams always like their coffee. But it's not only pouring cups of coffee that make you lose your coffee right out of the pot. It you can evaporate. It can get cold and not be what we consider good coffee anymore. Now I'm giving you some, some quite technically things. Often in systems thinking, they use these causal loop diagrams. I'm really bad at drawing them. But I do like to scribble. I do like to like, scribble the thing down. So if I'm trying to work out what all's going on, I like to like, scribble it. So I'll show you how to do the diagram and whether you do it or not. But it's essentially the same as the other little picture. There's stuff flows in, there's some stock. There's a goal of the system, and there's an, an error condition. And then you look at the loop between the not delivering what you want, uh, right? And you say, how do we get it? Is it going to be a reinforcing loop or a balancing loop? You put a B or an R on it. So coffee is easy. Not enough coffee, you're going to pour some more in. I mean, it's not going to make more coffee. <laughs> right? There's nothing reinforcing. It's quite straightforward. But once we can figure out what we need to balance, we know what we must go in and out. All right. So let's try and do that to people rather than things. This is my team back home, and we all work remote, and we often just see each other's little squares on the screen. It's a little harder to, do, to figure out your systems remote, okay? so you've got to put a more, more effort into it. But all right, let's try it. Um, management says we need a new team of six people for this new project. Okay, so that sounds like, in that sense, can a team be a stock, Did you say? Can hire people for it? Um, what would deplete the stock? People can resign. I put that they could, well, I said we didn't want to hire anyone. <laughs> we wanted to hire people with skills. Um, I said you could lose skills. You lose skills because they become obsolete. You forget some stuff. So there's some like, quite intangible things that can go on, right? What are the gap conditions? Um, you know, Unhappiness is quite complicated. This is where it f starts to fall down, doing it like simplistically like this. So this essentially is a bit of a diagram of the Lego model of teams. Someone leaves, I replace them. 
like we were just little. All right. So I'm just going to go back, though, because if you were to try and analyze your, your own teams and you want to apply systems thinking and try and draw any of these things, even um, the hiring people with skills, the inflow, maybe you're finding it hard to attract people to the team. So there must be some loop there that if you could get, figure out where's the feedback, how do I find out, you could improve the people you're bringing into the team. You see, there can be loops on every single thing that engages with this. So when you start to look for those, you'll find new places where you can improve things. People leaving, you know, the exit interview. <laughs> so, so there's ways to make sure you, you, you trap the feedback that is available if you could just get it. Um, the, the low motivation one, let's just go on to the next. Uh, that one's weird. Is happiness a, a stock? Goodwill is slightly a stock, right? If you generally not mess the team around, they're generally happy. You know, there could be a little bump in the road and they'll come, and come back to being happy. But it's not a very durable stock. Okay? I mean, I wish it was. I wish there was the big box of happiness that we could all just take <laughs> and we were done. Unfortunately, it's very easy to destroy. You make people unhappy much faster than you can make them happy. Right? So there's these weird things when you start to think about things like skills, happiness, morale, and you start to think of them as stocks, possibly. You try and say, well, there's value here. Are we doing well or not doing well? Do you just remember, some are very fragile. Right. There are feedback loops, though, if you listen, if you're listening and engaged. So a couple last slides on the big picture of systems thinking. When you start to add more and more loops, you, you, you can see it eventually you could cover the world. <laughs> All right, so you have to draw a boundary over, around you, the scope of what you can affect, and what you're trying to achieve with this particular look at, at whatever the problem is and the, the misalign with what purpose. Um, so the, the idea is that if you, your goal is to swim in the sea, it's safer to start in the swimming pool. All right, so just sort of keep that in mind. The only way you can tell what a system is doing is to look at what it is doing. You can't go and ask anyone what it was intended to do. Okay, so you've always got to look below. Right? Most of the truth lies there. Um, also, it's, purpose is really hard to discover in systems. The example often used is, say, a university. But you would think the purpose of the university is to train students, train people, right? teach people. And that's true to a point, but if you go and you look at the accounts department of the university, have they got the same goal? Well, their goal is to kick students out for not paying fees. So you get these misaligned goals, all right, at all sorts of levels in your organization because they have their own agendas. So again, the only way to tell what a system is doing is to look at what it actually delivers, not what everyone said, oh, you know, this is our goal, because it might not be true. And then you must be able to move from what is the detail to what is the big picture. And they say telescope to microscope. OK, that was the, the lightning talk on systems thinking for you. I'll, I'll give you some references at the end of the talk, things that you can look at for yourself. But we'll, we'll practice a few more. I wanted to talk about the value of code. I mean, we said we're developers, so all right, let's, let's have a look at it. I mean, it is, code has value, yeah? What's the definition? Working code, you know, solving a particular problem, that has value. Um, can we store it? I think that's what I've been doing with my vault for the last couple of decades, <laughs> storing it. What makes it gain value? Is it just writing more code? Does that make the code you've got gain value? Not necessarily, if it's crap code. You can actually write more code and reduce its value. And there's all sorts of weird things you can throw in here. What if you've got a lot of NuGet packages? Who does not have a lot of NuGet packages? 
and the packages you rely on get changed. And who hasn't had to do that thing where this only works on version 4.27 of the package you're dependent on? And now, you actually would reduce, you, for, for the speed you got by not having to do everything yourself, you potentially also lose value later when you have dependencies you didn't foresee. So dependencies actually can reduce your code's value. Kind of weird? Go along for the ride. <laughs> the other thing that makes it less valuable, let, let, let's, let me tell you my view of what code value is. It's a three-pronged thing. It's the text, you know, the actual source code. It's the mental models in our heads, and I use the maze to explain that, and I'll tell you why. But if you think of that as a model, like, you know, it shows you where to go. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll explore that. If you don't have that model, with that text, it's less valuable. And it all hinges on specific people who know both. And I say that because the model itself could be reduced to documentation. We've all tried that. But it's understood differently by the next programmer. So it's, it's a three-way thing, is where the value of the code lies. Let's talk our way through that maze. The, the people who design the system, they have a clear picture, I hope, <laughs> in their heads of how everything works. If you need to get from this side of the maze to that side of the maze, they know where to go. Turn left here, right, right. This test will run, that'll, oh, you know, we know. Now, those people leave. Now, if you're very lucky, the next people who join the team had some of the original developers. And most of the model, most of the knowledge gets passed on. They, meant it, they weren't complete <laughs> non-communicators, and, and the next generation knows some of it. But those people leave. And so it, it's like a leaky bucket, right? That mentoring, that knowledge of that model. And then what this maze starts to look like, it looks like someone takes a, you know, they, they hack a piece, because they couldn't find their way around that, and they couldn't remember why it was that way, so they just hack through over here, and somebody else has built a sort of rickety wooden scaffoldy thing to get over over there because they also didn't want to go around that way. And somebody else has used a different coding language over there because I don't know why we were using that and you know, planted a different bush. And if you follow the, the maze model out, it's, it's how we end up with a big ball of mud. And it's mostly, it's the loss of the model. And when I say the first generation to second generation developers, I'm not even talking long time periods. I mean, the people who had most of the model, I mean, we could be talking a year, I mean, we could be talking a couple of months and they move on. You know, it can be quite, if you've got churn in your team, that bucket is going to leak badly. Which goes back to the point that you can't treat people as Lego blocks. So I'll make the statement that if you change one member of the team, you have a new team. Teams are immutable. Okay. I hope you agree. Not really seeing the nods, but I'm seeing a little bit of a <laughs> stunned thing. But it, that's how I felt when I read that thing about teams are immutable, because I always thought, oh, people enjoy a bit of change. But at what cost? You know, because we're losing all that knowledge. So these were the problems. Poor management, we can fix that, right? We can think about the fact that management's job is to manage the system and not the people. We can fix our working environments, that's simple. We can fix our, well, fixing some bad decisions in your systems, that's harder, but you need some braveness there. We can fix our processes, and we can treat people properly. Right, so those are all the, the, the counters of that. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on fixing it. I'm very sorry about that, because I hate to just complain. But the fact is, everyone's got slightly different problems. All I'm hoping is that some of these conditions are things you like, oh my God, I didn't actually realize how bad this was or that was. And that you're thinking of some things for yourself, where you're going to go and have a look at what, where could I, where could I change my inflow or outflow of system to make my world better. Right, that's really what I'm hoping. I've got a couple of extra things that I want to throw in. 
sustainable pace is one of the ways we help ourselves in our working environment. Really important. I don't see enough people who... who <laughs> I don't know, we, we do a lot of stuff by, you know, they talk about design by committee and we all get together and think. I have to leave to think. Okay. So you've got to, got to respect that too. Sometimes we've got to be able to come together and leave. I mean, I go on my mountain with my dogs and then I get the, pro the sol problem solved. <laughs> so whatever works for you. But if you have a full highway, you go nowhere. So when you're, you have too much work in progress or too many interruptions, you go nowhere. It's an old thing, old saying, but it's worth repeating. When it comes to the big pillar in front of you that you're always working around, it is actually worth trying to ask your management or if you've got a level of authority to, to let you go out and fix it because you want to get home. And then um, psychological safety, safety to fail. I love the words, but it's so hard. I mean, it's one thing if you make a mistake by, by accident. As long as no one jumps on you, we all learn it's all right, I'm human, it's fine. There's another scenario, which is go and do this experiment. But honestly, a lot of companies are actually, the subtext is, but don't cost us any money. <laughs> so we get to experiment a lot less than you'd think if you listen to us all say, you know, we got safety to fail. All we've got safety from often is at least we don't get crapped on. Right. Which is a help. I mean, I'm not knocking it. <laughs> I didn't really talk about this, but in terms of your team, and when I talked about those coding wars right in the beginning, the old stats, it turned out the teams that were good, everyone was good. Okay. The people where um, people came up DeMarco and Lister, they actually came up with the term 10x, but they weren't applying it to developers, they applied it to teams. They believed there were 10x teams because the environment and the management and the process and the, everything came together to let that team perform. So they believed in 10x teams. So South Africans play a lot of rugby, but essentially the thing is that everyone in your team that you lift up, you lift the standard of the team, you lift yourself. Right. There is never a time when mentoring somebody else in the team is a waste of time. <laughs> Especially if you want a stable team. Why do we want a stable team? Because we can't afford the leaky bucket of knowledge. So, low churn in your teams, it's like the holy grail. So I'll show you some more Cape Town pictures. These, we've got a lot of wind. <laughs> <laughs> and these trees have just, you know, they've gone with the flow. <laughs> they now just are in that shape. They've been hammered by the wind until they were le leant over. So we adapt, as humans too. We adapt to bad conditions. We, we, we can, we survive, but we shouldn't. All right. We need to detect when there's a, a problem and fix it. Here's my list of... Um, people that I like, people that I think you should read. The obvious one is Donella Meadows. I think anyone who's doing a little bit of systems thinking has read some of Donella Meadows. I've put up a different link there, so if you happen to look at it, there's a video link of hers. It's, it's hilarious as well as like really inspirational, but it's, that, it's, it's so old, I think it's VHS, that someone's put onto the internet, okay? <laughs> it's like the oldest recording you're gonna see. And she looks nervous when she starts, and she, but she starts talking about envisioning a better world. And I wanted to talk about that quickly because what she says is, how do you know what you want to fix until you know what you'd really like to be? <laughs> so, too often, she says, we cut ourselves off before we even start. We're like, well, I'm never going to fix that guy, that manager. He's always going to be like that. Or, you know, I've got to live with Jira, or I've just got to live with whatever it is. She didn't put Jira. There must be some good bits to it. <laughs> but in, in that video, she even asks people to like, close their eyes and imagine you get up in the morning and you're excited to go to work. So what does it look like? What, what, what is your desk? What is your environment? What are your teammates? Who are you talking to? And you can paint a picture in your head which says, hang on, no, that's what I want. 
is how often do we ask ourselves that? You can also apply this, I'm talking teams, you could apply this to how would you like your system, your, your user to engage with something. I think we use vision too seldom. We should be more often sharing our vision. And often people are scared, and we all have a bit of rant, we all have a bit of moan. But how often do we share our vision of a better something? Someone's going to say, oh, you're naive. Yeah, it can't be. We're so used to cutting ourselves off from greatness. So do a bit of envisioning. Go and look at that really old video and see if you don't get as inspired as I was, because I've always been a cynic about vision, and now I'm a believer. We can't even start anything unless we all know where we're going. And she also says once you've got this picture in your mind of where you want to go, the second step is research to figure out what's feasible, and then only implementation, alignment, and communication. And the other one I see often is we skip the research. We go, like, yeah, that's what we want to do, and we start doing. <laughs> so don't forget the, the research part in between, because if you slowed down and thought about it longer, you'd probably come up with better ideas. Um, somebody else quoted uh, that research, which is your first idea is seldom your best. So slow it down, do more research first, and then go ahead. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lorraine. So we do have some questions here. Um, what do you think causes the asymmetry between positive and negative feedback loops? The asymmetry? Yes, that's what it says here. <laughs> So, you know, a system gets into, it, it always returns to a stable position, actually. I mean, it has to, right? I mean, it, it will break apart. It's not the place you want it to be, but it is. That's the trouble, you see. Systems, they might be really like scraping the bottom of the barrel almost. You know, it's not what you want of it. But it is in some, for, for what the system was designed for now, a stable place. It actually always returns to symmetry. <laughs> And I mean, you can't go on being hot forever without something else breaking. Think about it like that. Yes, things are temporarily out of place, but the system will rectify them in some way. It might not be the way you thought it was going to happen. It's actually, it might be worth mentioning incentives at this point. Because we so often think we will manage the people rather than the system, we come up with incentive schemes. So I'll incentivize the person to do better not make it possible for them to do better. And how many times has that gone wrong? You know, the KPIs or whatever we're calling them now. Um, and then everyone just starts worrying about themselves. The incentive worked completely incorrectly. And, and we should be putting our time into making it possible for people to do good work. OK, thank you. <laughs> answered. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the other question is, um, how can we prevent the loss of the model? Yeah, apart from having people stay forever. Um, look, there are obviously things you can do. In, so I've always liked the idea that your tests are part of your documentation, because your tests say what results you're expecting. So your code, you know, the, the code is the truth, yes, it, it's what it does. It doesn't tell you why. So there's some supplementary documentation around the why that needs not be lost. We do it because, you know. And then there's also, and what answer do we expect? We, we can read that in our tests. I do see the tests as forming part of a whole as well in terms of documenting our code. And I do see, I think the idea that code is self-documenting is simplistic. It is self-documenting only insofar as the what it does, but it doesn't, never tells you why. I think it's really important to bring that sort of documentation back in and not be scared to do it. Um, the rest of it, yeah, a lot of it is obviously passing it on from people to people, mentoring, um, ensemble work. That's great, right? Because it's not one person worked on this, they're the only ones who know it. Because otherwise, until you get a chance to almost redo it, you won't know it. You won't know that piece of code. I think we all know that one. That's all done. Got Thank you. And there's one more. Do you have any advice on how to preserve the mental model so that it does not get lost when people leave? It's sort of the same as the previous yeah. question, isn't it? 
Yeah. Trouble is, you know, you, you explain to me what the code does, and I only understand some of that. You know, and then you forget some of it yourself. So we, we even ourselves, we forget. So you know, there, there is, or it is always a bit of a leaky bucket. The, um, the, the, the sure way to just pull the water out is to have churn in the team. That really is the message that I wanted for everyone. So the next time you've got management who said, it's okay, you know, three people resigned, sure, we'll hire three more. <laughs> you, you know, that, that's bad. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. It's really, really, really bad. Much worse than I'd realized myself many years back. Right, that's that for the questions. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much, Lorraine. <laughs>